Mr. Gallego, so I want you to know that. Did you see him at 6 30, Ron? <laughs> I was told he was at FanFest this morning. And, uh, if he beat me there, I was going to be very upset. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm glad to see him here. In any event, the uh, first item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of the June 10th meeting. If there are no changes to those minutes, I appreciate it. Any motion? Second. I have a motion and a second. Over here, over on my, uh, the left side. Uh, please, if there's no comments, cast your votes. The second row of the motion. Still pushing. There you there go. There it Finally. is. Okay. Okay. Can you close the, that, that item passes mm -hmm. unanimously. We'll next go to public comments. I have one request for public comments by uh, Catherine Rhodes. Science. We started our main meeting in the other room. So what happened uh, yesterday and last night uh, in Dallas? So, so we don't think I'm oblivious to what's going on. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> the next item is <coughs> the review of the draft board agendas. Kim. Um. Why don't I? It is going to be a 
<laughs> Magnificent meeting on July 22nd. <laughs> um, we have the draft board business agenda for July 22nd for your consideration. We have item one is approval of your meeting minutes from your June meetings, and then item two, public comments, communications, member comments. Um, item three, your standard actions from the policy advisory committees. Then moving to consent, on item four, we have a proposal to um, fully fund some um, grant uh, recipients to, to purchase vehicles for um, assist the seniors and disabled folks and stuff. So it's going to the Transportation Committee to wait and, um, next week and, and for a possible recommendation, but we'd like to bring that to the board on July 22nd. Approval number, um, item number five is approval of proposed solicitation and contract awards. We don't have any planned solicitations this month, but do have two contract awards that we anticipate um, for next month. Item six is your standard um, item we bring every year. In October, um, we hold a Ride Your Month and Walk, Ride, and Roll the School campaign, so we'd like the board to adopt a proclamation um, for October 2016 and encourage our member agencies to do the same. Items seven and eight on your consent are your standard monthly reports on meetings and events attended on behalf of SANDAG and report summarizing delegated actions taken by the executive director. And under chair's report, we'd like to um, recognize the recipients of the 2016 I Commute Diamond Awards. These are employers and other organizations that promote alternatives to driving alone with their, their employees and students and whatnot. So we'd like to recognize those, those folks. And moving on to reports, item 10, uh, we've been having these pretty much once a month, is the uh, proposed hearing of necessity <coughs> or property interest for the proposed corridor. We'd like to bring um, a few of those. Item 11 is asking your approval of a um, CEQA exemption for the Uptown Bikeways project. Um, the Board and Transportation Committee has heard a lot about that project over the last year, and so we'd like to bring that for approval. Item 12 is the Transnet 2016 bond issuance review and approval of documents. That's also going to Transportation Committee next Friday. We'd like the Board to approve this. This would allow us um, to go out in the market um, and sell about $350 million um, worth of bonds um, that we proposed to do in August. It's pretty much historic um, low interest rates these last several weeks. Item 13 is your draft 2016 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, which is your RTIP. Um, including the air quality conformity determination. Um, we're asking the board to release that for public review and we'll be coming back in the fall um, for formal adoption of the RTIP. And then item 14, um, it's your annual call for projects for specialized transportation grant programs. Um, so the, the proposal, proposed criteria are going to Transportation Committee next Friday as well, and so we'd like to bring that to the board um, the following week. Item 15 is your annual report from the chair of your independent taxpayer oversight committee. So, uh, Chair, Chair Barnum will be uh, bringing the committee's annual report. And then item 16, uh, in the fall, in, during September and October, is Navy Fleet Week. So we have actually folks here today, but um, on a different item, but we'd like to do a presentation about um, the Navy Fleet Week at the July 22nd meeting. And then 17, 18, and 19 are just your standard continued public comments, upcoming meetings, and adjourn. So that's what we have for July 22nd. Okay. Would you like me to talk about the August meeting as well? <laughs> okay. so, yeah, so the August meeting is uh, scheduled for August 12th to board policy. We don't have any items. Um, and so, you know, attending that, we propose to basically cancel and, and likely go dark in August. So, unless there's a need that arises, right. there will not be a meeting on August Correct. 12th. Record that in your schedules. Okay. Uh, that completes everything, Kim? Yes, that's it. Okay, that, we'll move on now to item number yeah. four. Oh, we do need a... Uh, I'm sorry. And Todd is. Yes, if I may, just a quick question. Go ahead. The Uptown Bikeways item, any changes uh, since we last seen it? I know it was late in the previous agenda, but no, no modifications, no changes. Yeah, there's no modifications. Thank you. And happy to move the item. Okay. There's second. a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. and that's passed unanimously. So we'll move on now to item number four. Uh, item number four, I've got, <coughs> we're going to start with a report now. We've got uh, a number of speakers on this item. 
much. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, in uh, 1980, SANDAG uh, executed a memorandum, a memorandum of agreement, or an MOA, with the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, which established a cooperative working relationship between SANDAG and the military in the San Diego region. Uh, amongst other things, the agreement established an advisory position for the Department of Defense on the SANDAG board. Um, also, in 2013, SANDAG formed the San Diego Regional Military Working Group, which is chaired by uh, Coronado Council Member Mike Flywoody, who is here this morning. Um, and that was established as kind of a working venue for the various branches of the military, SANDAG, adjacent local jurisdictions to address areas of mutual interest and some of the things that the, that the working group uh, discusses and works on are things like uh, regional growth, habitat preservation, transportation, housing, water, and energy. Um, the working group is made up of uh, representatives of each of the major military installations in the region. Uh, adjacent local jurisdictions uh, are represented as well as the Port of San Diego. Um, so recently, SANDAG received letters from the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps uh, that basically included two requests. The first one was to, um, to update the MOA to reflect uh, changing conditions. The last time the, the MOA was put in place in 1980, the last time it was updated was 1986, so 30 years ago, so it's been a while. Um, and the other request was to change the, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense representation on the SANDAG Board of Directors itself. Uh, historically, the, the Department of Defense has been represented by uh, active duty military personnel and the proposal contained in the letters which are in your report um, is to change from an active duty representative to a senior civilian staff member as the representative on the SANDAG board. Um, obviously the region has changed a lot in the last 30 years uh, given that the last time the MOA was updated was 1986 and with the recent adop uh, adoption of our regional plan, the San Diego Forward Regional Plan, we think it's a good time to consider you know, changes and updates to the, to the MOA. And we're suggesting that the military working group is the appropriate venue uh, to, to work on that, and to, to be given that responsibility to take a look at the MOA and, and work on updating it. So should the executive committee uh, approve the requests that are before you today, um, the SANDAG staff will um, update the board of directors roster uh, immediately and then initiate the work with the military working group to update the MOA. Um, the updated agreement um, it would be brought to the SANDAG Board of Directors for consideration and approval. Um, so with that, the recommendation before you is the Executive Committee is asked to approve the change in the U.S. Department of Defense representation on the SANDAG Board of Directors and direct the military working group to facilitate an update to the memorandum of agreement between SANDAG and the U.S. Department of Defense. And, um, Admiral Rich is here this morning, uh, Commander in Navy Region Southwest, to address the Executive Committee. That concludes my report. Yeah. Admiral, we're honored to have you here, and we'd like to give you a chance to comment. Thank you, Chair Roberts and uh, members of the Executive Committee. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. And uh, I'm here to support, uh, to ask for your support for agenda item number four. Uh, specifically has been talked about, the 1986 memorandum of agreement is, uh, is clearly well out of date. And I'd like to ask your, your consideration of support for my recommendation to nominate uh, as the DOD advisory member on the San Diego board, my executive director, Mr. Uh, Joe Stuyvesant, who is, who is here today. Uh, this might seem like a significant change since for the past 30 years, the uh, Navy representative of the board has in fact been the Naval Facilities Engineering Command Southwest Commanding Officer. But in reality, it's not. Uh, the Navy has grown and updated our organizational structure uh, over those three decades. You know, the Navy Region Southwest didn't exist in 1986 uh, by, that, by that name. Uh, today, Navy Region Southwest has operational, financial, and managerial responsibility for all the Navy spaces that are within SANDAG's area of, uh, of jurisdiction. One of my res fundamental responsibilities is to represent the Navy's broader interests and specifically those of our operational tenants. Uh, to those surrounding communities. So Navy Region Southwest is the appropriate military command to work with SANDAG 
and NAPAC Southwest as one of my supporting commands will continue to play a key advisory role in many of the uh, interactions with SANDAG. In fact, this update will simply document the construct under which we've been operating for some time uh, rather than specifically change, it, uh, change the, uh, the structure. Additionally, shifting the Navy's representative to a uh, senior civilian uh, vice uniformed officer actually has benefits uh, to SANDAG. Namely, that's to provide the continuity and stability as military commanders change every two or three years, like myself. And I might add, as executive director, Mr. Seidens has access to all the resources of Navy Region Southwest, uh, as well as NAPAC Southwest. He's my senior civilian leader and the deputy commander for, for Navy Region Southwest. And lastly, he served several years on SANDAG's public safety committee. Uh, General Vanna supports this at uh, NCI West, uh, and I ask for your support uh, when I go to the I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Admiral. Question? Of course, I have questions. Admiral, help, help me understand this. Um, this is, for me, it's a sea change because the Marines always wanted to seat on sand egg. And so I'm glad to see that um, both of the services have, have reconciled and, and are, are pretty happy with um, your command supporting the naval services in this region. Now, my understanding is that the captain that currently sits on our board is from a different command than yours. He's a not a direct report to you. He is a direct report, report to me. He, he has two, two, two differing changes, uh -huh. changes of command. Okay. Uh, and actually, more than that, in, in a way, and he right. works for MCI West as well. Uh, he does facility support for MCI West. He works for me, and he's my in, my in for my uh, my logistics and, uh, and maintenance and engineering uh, technical advisor. So he's a direct report to me. And he also reports on the NAFAC. Because I always liken um, the NAFAC personnel to kind of what we do in our cities, which is I have a small city. And if we can't afford a whole engineering department, so we will contract with a company to su provide engineering support. So they do report to us. But as your NAFAC person, they also report to their admiral back in DC, I think. Um, so this current captain is an engineer. Is 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 NAFAC? I'm sure they're not protesting this because it's going to free up the captain to have more time to do what he needs to do. Is that a fair statement? Uh, uh, I, I think this time uh, in support of SANDAG, uh, you know, may or may not. That will be <clears throat> that will be dependent on the particular issue. Okay. You still have you still have complete access to his resources and technical capability. Okay. As a direct report of mine, okay. you also have fuller and more more direct access to all of the other resources of Navy Region Southwest at the same time. So it's a you know it's it's an additional set of resources available to the Sandex Board formally, which you're already enjoying. We're just asking to document the relationship right. that already exists. Right, and and I think Joe is a fabulous person. I've worked with him. I chaired public safety, and, and I got no issues. I, just, me. <laughs> I have no issues <laughs> with your choice at all. I'm just trying to make sure we understand what's happening here because I do think it is a little bit of a change. Um, now, in terms of your command structure, I want to know, because I heard you say he is, I wasn't sure what you said Joe was in the command, but my my, I thought I understood that it was you and then it was your XO if you have one. That you're chief of staff. In, Where does Joe fit in all that? In uh, di different organizations have different constructs. In my organization, uh, as the commander, there's a deputy commander, and I have a chief of staff and an executive director. Uh, the executive director is primarily responsible for the program execution, and the, the chief of staff is primarily responsible for the non civilian staff execution. And I know that's, you know, we can talk a long time about that. It's, it's not clear, but uh, I also have a deputy commander, which is one of those two, depending on, and that's a region by region selection of who, which of those two chains that the regional commander chooses to be his or her deputy commander. And Joe is uh, the executive director because of his stability and his background is, in fact, my deputy commander. So when I, in my absence, he is the commander. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions? Admiral, we had some problems in the past with the commanding general Marine Corps base Camp Pendleton wanting to have somebody sit on the board for the Marine Corps base. 
it didn't happen, but you're having a civilian management person sit here. Are they also going to represent Camp Pendleton and the military up there? They will certainly represent those interests and we'll reach out to them frequently and, and keep them involved in any of the issues that are, that are going on. Thank you, sir. Okay, any further questions? I don't thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, we have one of our colleagues who I thought only allowed, because he's putting quite a bit of time on this. Mike, if you, if you want to comment on this, I think. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> uh, you created the military working group largely in response to General Leonard, who at the time was Marine Corps Installations West, request for a seat on the board or for a better way of working with Sandag to get military information into our planning process to get our planning process more responsive to the needs of the military. So the military working group was created to address that. What that highlighted to me was the importance of the representative who sits on the board being uh, able and willing to represent the interests of the Marine Corps because from a transportation planning standpoint and other things that Sandag is involved in, the Marine Corps maybe draws more water than the Navy, but it certainly is significant in one way or the other. So I think General Banta's letter, which I know from talking to his staff is carefully considered, uh, answers that question. And if the Marines and the Navy are unified in wanting to take this approach, then I think it's, uh, it, it's incumbent on us to support it. Secondly, the, uh, addressing the update of the MOA, there's a considerable intersection between what's described in that MOA and what the Charter of the Military Working Group is. In fact, I would maybe make the statement that had we been doing all the things in the MOA, we might not have needed the Military Working Group, but maybe we would have had to create something else in order to serve that function, because there's a lot of spade work involved in that. So I do think it's appropriate that that come to us, that we work on it with the services uh, to, to make it more responsive to the needs of the board and the services. Thank you, Mike. I have one more public uh, uh, request for testimony on this. That's Catherine Rhodes.
to the Admiral, please cure my plea of 10 years and not build the building on top of an active vault because there's so, so much um, opportunity to not do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that concludes the public testimony. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, just a quick comment. I, I think this is a very positive change. Supporting what staff said, the Admiral said, I won't repeat the reasons, makes a lot of sense. I personally know Joe, and he, he's outstanding. And to have somebody that would provide the continuity, the stability in the representation here for the military, I think is really, really important. Besides, Joe's from Pamul. <laughs> and he also makes really, really well, good that puts the deal off. <laughs> <laughs> he makes really, really good pizza, too. Oh. Mm. We're going to test him on that. Okay. <laughs> if there are other, any other relevant comments, this is your, your chance. I'm looking for a motion, then, for approval, which I, I think is warranted. Move yeah. approval. I have a, a, another approval by... Uh, Mayor Voss and a second by Mayor Morrison. Uh, please cast your votes. Voting is closed. That's approved unanimously. Admiral, thank you for joining us here today. And thank you, sir. Councilman why would he thank you for your testimony, sir. your eloquent testimony. We look forward to having you here for Pizza Joe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. With that, I'm going to go on to item number five, which is a legislative status report. Robin's going to be giving us that. And I have one speaker's request on that. I'll let Robin give the report first. All right. Good morning. Last Friday was the last day for all bills to get out of their respective policy committees in Sacramento. And so the state legislature is now officially on summer recess until August 1st. As such, I have a few updates for you on some of the bills that we've been following. <coughs> AB 2289, the Owen Shop Bill by Assemblymember Frazier, and AB 516, the Temporary License Plate Bill by Assemblymember Mullen, have both successfully passed out of the legislature and are currently awaiting the governor's signature. Uh, in addition, AB 2170, the Trade Corridors Improvement Fund by Assemblymember Frazier, continues to move successfully through the legislative process. In addition, Senate Bill 885, which was the indemnification bill that Sandeg opposes, ultimately was pulled by the author and so effectively remains dead for this legislative session. Unfortunately, Assembly Bill 1746, which was the bus on shoulders bill by Assembly Member uh, Stone that Sandeg supports, ended up facing some pretty significant opposition by the California Association of Highway Patrolmen, which is a union arm of the CHP. So the author decided to pull the bill for consideration for this legislative session. We're going to continue to work with the sponsors to determine what the appropriate steps may be for this bill going forward. Another bill that's moving through the legislative session that we would like to bring to your attention is Assembly Bill 1500 by Speaker Emeritus Tony Atkins, which would authorize the California Transportation Commission to relinquish certain portions of State Route 75 to the cities of Imperial Beach and San Diego. <laughs> This bill was introduced in response to the U.S. Navy starting a series of improvements along the state route that are expected to generate a significant amount of congestion once fully constructed and occupied. According to the bill analysis, the Imperial Beach City Council would like to have more direct control over State Route 75 within its boundaries so that it can work with the Navy in managing this traffic. AB 1500 is sponsored by the City of Imperial Beach and is supported by City of San Diego Council Member David Alvarez and there's no known opposition at this time. Support of this bill is consistent with goal number 16B of the SANDAG Legislative Program, which supports other, le or other organizations' legislative programs when consistent with the SANDAG Program, and staff is recommending a support position from the committee. I know we have a couple speakers I can go on. There's one other item that we're going to be asking for action on today. I can go through it all. So would you like me to stop now? Uh, why don't you go through, through it all and then we'll go sure. through public testimony. Okay. So also up for consideration today is the No Blank Checks initiative that we talked about at our last meeting. As you may recall, this initiative would require that all bonds issued or sold by the state in the amount of $2 billion or more must first be approved by the voters at a statewide election. The measure was submitted to the Attorney General by Dean Cordopazzi in response to the Governor's plans for the Delta Tunnels. However, it becomes relevant for SANDAD because the initiative is written so broadly that it could also be seen as applying to statutorily created agencies like SANDAD. It's opposed by the Citizens to Protect California Infrastructure Co Coalition, which is co-chaired by the President of the California Chamber of Commerce and the California State Building and Construction Trades Council. 
and consists of nearly 60 infrastructure, <coughs> business, labor, public safety, and health entities. The California Democratic Party and the California Republican Party also are opposed to the measure. Opposition to the no-blink checks initiative is consistent with goal number 6B of the Sandag Legislative Program, which supports fiscal reform initiatives that enable regions to develop their own fiscal strategies, and staff is recommending an opposed position on this initiative. And that concludes my report. I'm happy to ask you Okay. Thank you, Robin. Let me go to the public testimony, and then we'll come back to this. And let Catherine Rhodes to speak on this. Let me finish. Okay. Please. Uh, I, I attended a meeting the other night and saw a community very, very upset. And it's because there's been an attitude that the airport can't spend money, uh, even for mitigation of the things that are being done that we're seeing in <coughs> a community. The, the problem was myopic at best, putting in the rental car without looking at how the cars are going to get in and out of that facility. And we're seeing a lot of problems as a result of that. And it's, and it's basically an attitude that we're the airport and we don't do stuff off the airport because the federal doesn't allow that. There's been virtually no mitigation on Grape or Hawthorne or Laurel. We're now sassafras for the changes that they've made. And I'd like to see something back in writing in terms of what the with the possibility that we have of affecting this, uh, this situation. Mayor Sessom. Number one, I'm an elected official. I sit on the airport authority board. So you oh, are great. wrong. You are wrong. Great. There are several. I represent East County. And great every talk. region here 
has an elected official, including the city of San Diego. And Greg Pop serves on the board. That meeting was not about traffic on in India. It was an update to the community about what was happening on the airport, and they got ambushed because no board member was there. So that that I'm a little upset about, as you guys can tell. Having said that, I think this is an excellent investigation because for once and for all, it will put to bed the question that the airport authority is being stingy and not accepting its responsibilities by using FAA money. Now, I hear this from Gary all the time when I ask questions about, can we use this money for more DBE? Can we use this? No, 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 no. It's federal. It's got strings on it. Let's get this done. And I want to tell you, you guys don't want the planning back. You don't want the operations back. You don't want anything back. <laughs> you want the taxi cabs. Todd goes with taxi cabs. You steal taxi cabs, Uber, and Lyft. You don't want it. <laughs> so once and for all, I support that investigation by our staff. And I certainly hope that they will feel free. We have a new general counsel at the airport. Feel free to draw on her offices for any help that you have. And I will inform the board of the chair of the airport authority for bowling that this is going to be coming down the way and, and hopefully she will say full cooperation. Good. I'm sure she will. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Truman, just for clarification, I, I, I think as we do this, we, we need to do it in partnership with the airport authority so that we're both feeding in the best information we have to sort of figure well, out. Well, you, you obviously have to be in contact with them. Okay. I don't want them writing the report. We'll, no, we'll write it, but I think we need to work in partnership because I, as Mayor Sessom understands or, or points out, I mean, when it comes to dealing with FTA and FHWA, those are the agencies that we know very well. When it comes to dealing with FAA, we don't know them as well as we do FHWA and, and FTA, but I think the airport authority probably knows them better. So with your permission, you know, we'll work with them yeah. uh, and write something that, that, that tries to answer this question. Okay. Yeah, and I understand the, the FTA's funds, and, but I'm raising the question, there are other funds that are available that are being used to mitigate, and what we found out when we had to sue San Diego State, that it doesn't make a difference. You've got to mitigate for the things that you're doing. Okay? So you've got to find funds to do it, and they, they're not doing that. Okay? So, Okay, so it's beyond just federal funds too, then it's for mitigation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The issue of can they and do they have a responsibility to mitigate the projects off site? I contended that. I had them tell me at public meetings that they don't they are not allowed to do that. And I don't believe that. Okay? Okay, now going back away from the airport. Uh, Mayor uh, Dedina is here and Councilmember Kerry Downey. Are here to speak to the issue of the state highway on the sort of street. Wherever you feel comfortable. I sit in the chair. Yes. You can have a chair. This is a little bit more fun. Uh, right. So, State Highway 75, I, I'm sure all of you have been to Imperial Beach, so you know exactly where it is when you exit Palm Avenue on Highway 5. It's a six lane state highway that extends through the southern end of the city of San Diego through Imperial Beach and then turns northward again to Coronado. This bill talks about the city of San Diego and the city of Imperial Beach portion of that. Um, I think as some of you know, this, the Navy is going to invest about a billion dollars in a special warfare training facility at the southern end of Coronado on the Silver Strand, the northern end, edge of Imperial Beach. It's a great project, actually very, very environmentally great project. They've taken all their development off of sensitive lands. It's, all that's great. We're very supportive of this project significant investment on the part of the military. We'll also have a significant positive benefit uh, to Imperial Beach in terms of its economic impact. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, transportation planners have, have really looked at the traffic, which is significantly impacted on Highway 75, caused all kinds of air quality emissions, um, that will increase as a, as a result of this project. And so in coordination with Caltrans and the Navy and our partners at the City of San Diego, we've embarked on a master planning effort to really identify ways to improve traffic flow, but more importantly, make this a much more business, pedestrian, and bike-friendly thoroughfare. We have some of our lowest income neighborhoods, highest density neighborhoods, <coughs> lots of children and families that live along this corridor. 
frankly, lots of people already bike along it and walk along it, and it's our major transit corridor. So thanks to the support of the Navy and Caltrans, we have been embarked on a, uh, complex negotiations to look at the relinquishment of this highway. We think it'd be a much easier way to secure investment, to improve it as part of our master planning effort, and more importantly, would limit the sort of burdensome permitting requirements that Caltrans acknowledges can uh, limit local communities like Imperial Beach from actually improving um, these, these, are, these, these major thoroughfares in our city. So that was an example. We have about $30 million or more going into a Sudbury uh, commercial shopping center that was on the front page of the San Diego Daily Transcript this week. Uh, that's under construction now. But just a permitting for that, for the modification of Highway 75 was extensive and took a long time. So uh, this is a really great project that sort of highlights every type of public policy and great planning that San Diego is undergoing in terms of um, active transportation and more importantly, getting cities and jurisdictions more local control over really making our major thoroughfares more pedestrian, bike friendly, transit friendly, but more importantly, much more traffic friendly as well. And so as part of this effort, the Navy has uh, secured investment for synchronizational lights from through the city of San Diego and Imperial Beach. We're trying to fast track that, but overall this is a great project and we are thankful to our partners, the city of San Diego, again, uh, Caltrans, and San Diego has given us lots of guidance on this and investment for our master planning process. So that's it, are there any questions? Do you support it? I'm sorry? Do you support it? Yeah. <laughs> The day I got elected, this is my first meeting at um, Marty, Senator Marty Block's office to talk about this. So, uh, anyway. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Councilor Evan Alley. When the bill was originally uh, a different number, and this was a government to fix this, uh, Coronado was on the uh, list because it was supposed to be a relinquishment of all of SR 75, which would have run all the way from the Palm Avenue and off the 5 through Imperial Beach, up the Strand, through Coronado, and up to a portion before it gets to the bridge. And Coronado was, uh, had not started all the great planning that uh, Mayor Zadina talked about that Imperial Beach had been doing with the Navy and with Caltrans. It was uh, news to us. We hadn't requested this. We hadn't started investigating it. And so we requested that uh, uh, Speaker Emeritus Atkins remove us from the bill so that we could wholeheartedly support what was going to be happening to improve Imperial Beach and San Diego. So that has happened. It's now a renumbered bill. And we're just here to say we completely support it. We never did object to the bill. We just requested we be removed because we hadn't done anything. So at this point, we also support this bill and, and appreciate all the work because we have been working with uh, Caltrans. And at some point, we may come back couple of years we have a plan like theirs and hopefully you would support us should we ever show up but not today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well between Tony Atkins, Mayor Dina, Carrie Downey, David Alvarez, uh, I move the recommended <laughs> action. <laughs> and do you want a motion for the other item as well or are you taking separate votes? I think to direct the staff to uh, investigate that uh, not the Air Force thing, oh, no. the, the question of the what the oh, yeah, sure. checks. I, I hate repeating a, a yeah. really ridiculous political uh, we, disappropriation we term. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would make both staff recommendations um, in the motion uh, and appreciate staff's great work on keeping us impressed of what's going on in Okay. Uh, second. Second to that motion. Oh. Terry, did you second? I second the motion. Okay, this, was the <laughs> this was for the opposition of the legislation and and yeah, we'll support, support. 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 <coughs> in opposition. Okay. 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 Just okay. Three, three, three things. S support the legislation for the relinquishment. Come back on the airport stuff and try to answer the questions that were posed or, or posed here. And thirdly, oppose the first the, the, the no blind right. check. Okay. So that's, that's, I just want to make sure we were uh, so you kept saying two. <laughs> Not I heard three. Okay, so that's what I wondering. Okay. Uh, if there's no further comment, please cast your votes. Okay, voting is closed. That's approved unanimously. And we, do we have, do we have oh, better? I'm sorry. <laughs> we have another half. Go ahead, Becky. No, so I have a brief federal um, update. This week, Congress was notified that USDOT has made an announcement on the fast lane grant funding, and the SR11 Segment 2 project was selected to receive $49.28 million. 
These funds will go to construct a one-mile segment of the highway, extending from SAR 11 to the Okay Mesa Port of Entry. This is a joint application between Caltrans and Sandag. The project was the only project selected in the state of California, one of 18 nationwide for a total of $759 million. Overall, there was 212 applications that were submitted, totaling roughly $10 billion, so the program was um, over 10 times oversubscribed. The grant funding will leverage $50 million in state shop funding and an additional 19.2 in local toll revenue funds. So we're extremely pleased to make this announcement. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, give kudos to staff on this. Uh, we were asking for a little more, and that's okay, but they had asked, they had actually suggested us to peel back to $40 million and we were looking at what bridges and other things could be eliminated at this time and they, essentially the highway still go ahead. So they were suggesting $40 million and we gave a proposal for $40 million. But they came back and they didn't get us all the way to plus $50 million, but they got us to 48, 49 point some odd million. And I think it's a, a testament the staff that we're, we're getting at it really underscores the importance of being prepared to be in a position where you can move on those things. Uh, this is this is a home run for sure. This is very important. Work. You notice I said home run and keeping with the theme. <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, there's no action needed on that. That's an information item. Action needed. It says here on my thing that the next meeting is August 12th, but the executive committee meeting will not be conditional or will be conditional. We're, is that one being scrubbed? Yeah, we the, don't have any items, so we propose to one. That one you right. can take off your schedule. The other one you got to leave open in case. We in case. Okay. For the time being, leave the regular meeting on the schedule to take the executive meeting off, and it's likely that the other meeting would be... Uh, would not be needed either. So with that, uh, we'll declare the meeting adjourned. We'll open the full meeting in a few minutes. Okay. Good. So